So when things start to go well, one of the temptations is to expand, to add additional services, to um, explore new entrepreneurial opportunities. And I want to talk about that today because there's a right time, there's a right way to do that, and there's a wrong way to do that. And this is where I made some pretty big errors the last time around. And I want to make sure people don't make the mistakes that I made. Um, Wallace Waddles, who I talk about quite often, an author I talk about a lot, um, in his book, The Science of Getting, of Getting Rich, talks about how the object of all life is development. Um, man, he says, the object of all life is development. I'm reading from the first chapter of The Science of Getting Rich by Wallace D. Waddles. The object of all life is development, and everything that lives has an inalienable right to all the development is a capable of, of, it is capable of obtaining. Man's right to life means his right to have the free and unrestricted use of all the things which may be necessary to his fullest mental, spiritual, physical, and, uh, and physical enfoldment, or in other words, his right to be rich. And he talks about that um, later in another chapter, and I just turned right to it. <laughs> awesome. Um, a seed dropped into the ground. This is chapter 5. This is the second paragraph, or third paragraph, sorry. Um, a seed dropped into the ground springs into activity, and in the act of living produces a hundred more seeds. Life by living multiplies itself. It is forever becoming more. It must do so if it continues to be at all. Intelligence is under the same necessity for continuous increase. Every thought we think makes it necessary for us to think another thought. Consciousness is continually expanding. Every fact we learn leads us to the learning of another fact. Knowledge is continually increasing. Every talent we cultivate brings to mind the desire to cultivate another talent. We are subject to the urge of life, seeking expression, which ever drives us on to know more, to do more, and to be more. Now, I know that that may be more true for some people than others, right? Some people are naturally much more ambitious than others. Some people are either have been conditioned to be lazy. Maybe I shouldn't have said naturally ambitious. I think that you learn to be ambitious through your upbringing and your the, in values that you're instilled with. But the point is that just as when you put a pot uh, or a plant into a pot, it grows and grows and grows until it exhausts its container. And then eventually you have to take it out of another container and put it, the, the old container, and put it in a bigger one, and it'll outgrow that one. And it'll grow to its full natural capacity. You know, whatever its DNA tells it. You know, some plants grow, are just, you know, they're coded to, to grow bigger than others. But this innate um, drive, this innate desire, impulse for growth and for expansion and for expression, it's just as natural in, a human, in the human mind as it is in the plant. The same thing which causes us to want more um, uh, deeper and more expansive expression of the desires and ambitions that is inside us is the same thing that makes a plant grow. And, you know, some plants are so intense they will actually crack the pot that they're in if you don't put them in a bigger one. Some will crack the foundation of your house to, to seek out water so that they can continue to grow and to expand. So this is something that is natural. It, it's inherent in every living thing. In fact, I can't remember who said this, but um, it was maybe a poet or a scientist, but he said, that growth is really the only sign of life. It's the most telling sign of life, that's certain, that something is actually growing. And I'm not talking about growing in the way that the book uh, <laughs> pile on my desk is growing. That's, a, that's not really growth. We're using growth as a metaphor to describe the accumulation of objects within one physical space. But the need for growth, the need to expand and to express whatever genetic blueprint is on the inside of you is inherent in all living things. And it's also in the consciousness and intelligence of, of man. Uh, man, mankind, humankind, whatever you want to call it. And so as an ambitious entrepreneur with a creative mind who sees um, problems that they want to solve, things that they want to do, contributions they want to make, money they want to make, um, new businesses they want to start, you're going to have this tendency to want to grow um, probably sooner than you're ready in sometimes. Now, knowing when to follow those urges and impulses is really important. And also knowing how to recognize the difference between the urge to grow and to expand and to branch out and the flip side impulse, the counterfeit impulse, which is the impulse to chase after shiny objects and opportunities because you are hoping there's going to be less work or that the grass is going to be greener somewhere else other than where you are. It's important to make a distinction between those two things. Now, 
So let's start with the first. Um, how do you stay out of the shiny object trap? How do you know that the impulse for you to grow and to expand and to add new things isn't just a shiny object? Well, ask yourself, is what you're doing something that really makes you come alive on the inside? You know, in my past podcast, how it, entrepreneurship is where contribution meets obsession meets strategy. You have to have all three of those things. If you find a, you know something that you are obsessed with and that you love and that you're passionate about but is not making a, a worthwhile contribution to the world, guess what? People aren't going to pay you for it. You may still want to pursue that passion or that hobby, but don't try to make a business out of it. You know There are plenty of great artists and composers in history who were able to make a living doing what they loved, you know, writing music or painting, and then there's others who didn't. Like Vincent Van Gogh, who you know his his brother was a, a successful businessman who bought his art supplies, and he never was able to make enough money to even buy his supplies. But now he obviously has made a contribution to the human consciousness with his work. So um, you know there may be things that you're doing in your lifetime that won't be completely appreciated. Um, in fact, I was talking to my mom about this this weekend because she, you know we got into discussing you know one of her um, relatives who had passed away and who had this ambition. To do something that is to start adult coloring books. This was several years before the whole mandala um, craze came out. And now, look, everybody is crazy about adult coloring books. But when she first was talking about it, people didn't get it. Human consciousness was still being prepared. Right? The collective consciousness was not ready to receive that idea yet. There are tons of inventions that happen that way, where the person who you actually think invented the thing wasn't the person who invented it. They're the person who found a way to bring it into mainstream consciousness. Thomas Edison was a master of this, and as some of you know who have really studied him in his life, you know that he didn't invent a lot of his stuff. He actually, um, you know, Nikola Tesla invented a lot of the things that, that Thomas Edison ended up profiting from, and some of the things Nikola Tesla invented, Thomas Edison suppressed because he knew how to market. He knew how to manipulate the consciousness of, of the, the people of the day. You can say that that's unethical if you like, but the point is um, that... And as an entrepreneur, you need to know how to get ideas into the collective consciousness somehow to where people value them enough in order to embrace them, use them in their everyday lives, and pay you money for them. You may have an idea that is so revolutionary that it's just not ready for that, no matter how good of a marketer you are. I had an idea like that several years back that people are now just starting to get you know, a hang of. And, you know... Some of the people who read my books got it, but a lot of them didn't because the collective consciousness wasn't ready for it yet. And so you have to be able to discern, okay, is what I'm doing, A, something I can be obsessed with, and B, something which makes a contribution to people, but is also a contribution that they have a high level of awareness about, right? So, you know, I mean, the guy who uh, invented the refrigerator died, was dumped into a hole in the ground, never made a penny from his invention, and he built the entire damn thing the whole prototype got the thing working. Now, you know, we have a refrigerator in practically every... I mean, think of how rich that guy would be today if he was uh, still alive and was making money off of all the refrigerators that were sold, even a little bit. Or if he was making money off of selling the idea or the, the concept or the model to people. But he didn't make anything off of it because people were not ready to receive it. So it's important that you, you ask yourself, okay... If I want to expand or grow out from what I'm doing now, is what I'm doing now in line with my personal obsessions? Am I applying the right strategies? And you know, is it making a contribution to the to collective? And if it's not, if one of those things doesn't line up, then you should have moved out. Of, you should have never been in that business in the first place. And that desire to get out of the business may be a desire to, to move into something that you actually are obsessed with but it has to meet all three of those criteria. Obsession, contribution, strategy. Okay, If what you're doing right now isn't working, is your strategy bad? Are you not obsessed with it? Is it not making a contribution that people are consciously aware is being valuable enough to spend money on? If it's not one of those three things, and, and what I've found most of the time is that people end up doing things that are indeed making a worthwhile contribution to people that people are interested in buying but that the entrepreneur themselves doesn't really care about it right they're not obsessed with it they're not passionate about it and as I said in my past podcast I think it was last week you will always lose against the person who is obsessed 
Okay, the obsessed person within your niche is going to run squares around you because you're going to run out of gas long before they do. They're going to stay up till two, three, four o'clock in the morning, working on it, studying it, getting better at it because they cannot help themselves. There is no way you can compete with those types of people. You have to bring that to the table yourself, which means you have to do something that you have a natural obsession for. And don't think that you're just going to develop the obsession about something you don't care about. It doesn't work that way. Okay, so. Those are the three things. If you have those three things in line and, you're, and, and you know the strategy is working, the contribution is working, the obsession is working, and you're starting to see some results and starting to pick up some steam, then you're probably at some point going to get really excited about your success and get what I call entrepreneurial fever. Okay? <laughs> I just make these things up off the top of my head. Actually, I've been saying it for a while. Entrepreneurial fever is when you, you start – experiencing a little success and you start getting a little overconfident or a lot overconfident sometimes you think that you've got the thing figured out now I'll tell you um, Starbucks made this uber huge epic mistake last year and totally fucking ruined one of my favorite brands doing this they took over you guys might have heard of this they took over Tiavana they think figured well We've succeeded with coffee, so we may as well take over tea. What's what's so different about coffee and tea? And so they they sucked up Tiavana, right? They bought the company, and they basically fucking ruined it. I mean, because because of this moronic decision that they made to assume that because they had succeeded so big in the area of coffee that they were just going to branch right out into tea and copy and paste all their experience and all their success onto that, and it didn't work out that way for them, and they flopped big time. And I. I mean, there are dozens of companies that have made this mistake where they've assumed that they can just branch off into some other brand and make it successful. And the dumbest thing people will do is when they take the same brand and try to copy and paste it onto that new business endeavor. It's called line extension, right? It's when you're extending your brand into other things. Lifesavers did this, right? You know, Lifesavers used to be those little round candies. What the hell are Lifesavers now? You got Lifesavers gum, you got Lifesavers holes, you got all kinds of Lifesavers gummies. Lifesavers had literally diluted the power of their brand through extending their brand line from the little Lifesavers candies, where every time you heard the word Lifesaver, you thought of that little candy. Well, it, does, it no longer owns that mental real estate in the person's mind when you say Lifesavers because there's so many other things that a person can mean when they talk about lifesavers. They diluted the power of their brand. And so branching into new areas, a lot of the time, um, if you're going to branch into something that's different than what you're doing now, you should start a new brand, okay? Um, absolutely should start a new brand. I've found that a lot of people who find success in one very narrow thing, like for instance, let's just say that they're in marketing and they're, um, building automated marketing campaigns for people, right? And they think, well, we're going to become a boutique firm now, and we're going to add not just um, automation building, but we're also going to do pay-per-click marketing, and we're going to add design, and we're going to add press releases. And, and pretty soon, the business has attempted so much to grow sideways that they have stunted their upward growth. They've expanded out too much. They've added too much infrastructure. They've added too much operational complexity to their business early on. And as a result, they have tried to grow sideways instead of upwards, and it stops their upward growth, and they don't, they don't grow as quickly. A lot of people go, go out of business doing that. I'm not saying that you shouldn't expand into other things, but the point is that if you've found something that you do very, very well, um, Keep working at it and keep working at it, even when you get those urges and impulses to branch off into other things. Write those things down, set them aside in the drawer, and look at them six months from now. I guarantee you that some of the things you won't even be as excited about anymore because maybe they were just this impulsive idea that came into your head of something you wanted to do, and it turned out to not be a good idea. And thank God you didn't pursue it. What some people will do is, as soon as they get the idea, they go buy the domain name, they set up a website, they set up an autoresponder, they start trying to create products, and they're off and running. And... And meanwhile, the business that they are working on isn't getting as much juice and much energy and as much creativity and as much enthusiasm dumped into it because they're off in this new direction. So I think that everything that you should do should build up not only the brand that you're working on, but the specific and unique thing that you want to be best known for, the thing that you want to specialize in. You're either going to be a specialist or a generalist. People pay more money to specialists. All right? They pay less money to generalists, and this is becoming more and more important in today's cluttered marketplace. People want products that are specialized not only um, you know, 
within a, a to solve a certain problem, but for a certain type of customer demographic. People are, are evaluating brands more ideologically now than they were before. They want to work with brands that that you know embrace their political and religious and and, and worldview ideologies. I think that's inherently a good thing because it's going to cause people to be more transparent. But my point is that people want specialization and customization today, and you can't afford to branch out too early. If you do get to the point where um, you know you're ready to branch out, make sure that whatever you branch off into, whatever new thing you want to do, that is not it doesn't have a parasitic relationship with what you're working on now. In other words, whatever you're doing, the business that you're succeeding in, that's having this ravening success. Whatever you can invest back into that business from that business's profits, go ahead and invest it back into it. Don't try to start up some other things that's going to suck all the revenue and all the energy and all the creativity out of this, out of what you're working on now. So I, I'm saying this as much to my own myself as anybody else because I'm getting all kinds of cool ideas. I'm talking about them, you know, I'm writing them down, and I'm not, but I'm not going nuts about them. Um, the, the old me would have been off in ten different directions by now. Um, that's what I call entrepreneurial fever. It's the assumption that if you succeed at one thing, you can automatically translate that success to another thing. Psychologists call this the halo effect. It's when we get the idea that because we're really good at something or really smart about something or have really succeeded at one thing, that that's automatically going to um, equate to being successful in something else. It doesn't work that way. And so I want to leave you with this. There was um, there was a a book written about... I think it's about 10, 15 years ago. People always ask this ridiculous question as to whether or not this book is still relevant. And my answer is that it's always going to be relevant because it's based on timeless principles. But it's a book called Good to Great by Jim Collins. He also writes a second book as a follow-up to it called How the Mighty Fall. And Jim Collins did a, an unbelievable amount of research, I mean real research, where he actually went out into the companies and looked at the things that they did and interviewed people and looked at their marketing plans and their revenue and their growth over time and how sustainable the growth was. I mean, it wasn't just a bunch of egg-headed a think tank people sitting around a table thinking that they're smarter than everybody else because they have college degrees coming up with all these ridiculous theories about how companies grow. This guy did real in his team did real research. And the things that he found out are not only relevant today, they're more relevant than they ever were. I'll talk about the one that I think is important in a moment, but he wrote this book, Good to Great, to analyze all these companies that had gone from good to great and sustained their growth over a long period of time. And then what happened is some of those companies stopped doing the things that made them successful in the beginning, and they started tanking, right? And so, of course, every bobblehead out there had to go and criticize Jim Collins and say, well, your book didn't really predict this because the companies are going under. And Jim was like, no, you don't understand. These companies are going under because they stopped doing the things that I told that, that I talked about in the book. And people kept saying this and kept saying this is like and finally Jim Collins is like, fine, I'll tell you what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna write a book that specifically describes how the mighty fall. And and he wrote this brilliant book that described how businesses fall from being a great and successful business to being basically duds or going out of business. And the what he nails in this book is absolutely brilliant. I want to zero in on one concept that he talks about that he calls the hedgehog principle. And the hedgehog principle basically is, if you think of the way a hedgehog fights, a hedgehog has one move that it does in a fight. It curls up in a ball, it sticks its spikes out, and anything that goes near it gets spiked and runs away. That is the only thing that a hedgehog can do. But a hedgehog has one of the highest survival rates out in the wild because it does this. Right? It has a very simple strategy for fighting back against predators, and that's why it's so successful. So it, the hedgehog principle is when a business picks what I call a hill to die on. They pick one thing that they're going to do better than everybody else, that they're going to be known for, that they're going to be able to dominate the market with, and also penetrate the psyche of their customers with the idea and convince those people that they own that idea, that they are the, the, the company that does that one thing better than anything else. And the companies that did this and the few other things in the, the good to great uh, books had explosive growth to the point where they finally got so overconfident that they violated the hedgehog principle and started branching off into other areas, started started line extending, started trying to branch off into you know other product lines or, or product types, other even other industries, vertical markets, and as a result, they tanked. Now, 
it wasn't they didn't just do that in tank. There was there were a couple other variables, and one of them was um, overconfidence. The second was rationalization. He may not have called it that. I can't remember exactly what label he used, but it, basically what they did was instead of admitting that look we overextended ourselves, we did too much, they just started rationalizing, trying to cover it up, trying to you know find ways to kind of market their way out of it, and and that led to not only to operational bloat but to marketing bloat and confusion within the marketplace where people didn't really know what the hell the company stood for anymore and eventually the company just um, you know either petered out into mediocrity or went out of business so the, the point is the hedgehog story or the hedgehog principle is something is absolutely crucial for a new entrepreneur what is it that you're obsessed with that you have a rock-solid dependable scalable strategy um, applied to and that meets some sort of a Conscious, a need in the marketplace that people are consciously aware of being a real need that they will pay real money to have fulfilled. Those are the three things you need to have together. If you're in a business right now that doesn't have all three of those things lined up, particularly the obsession part, get out of it and get into something else. Okay, you Probably the reason that you want to get into something else is because you don't belong where you are right now, but make sure you're doing it for the right reasons. Too many people look at something like... Um, like it reminds me of when Groupon first exploded and made all this money and and I I wor used to work at Starbucks a lot back before I was married and I would sit there in Starbucks and I would write stuff that's what writers do we sit at Starbucks and we write and um, that was also before they fucking destroyed Tia Vanna and now I'm mad at them for it but anyway um, I would sit there in Starbucks and there would be I don't know how many people I heard who would just sit down at the table next to me or you know and I would overhear them talking about this new business that they wanted to start that was exactly like Groupon and I'm sitting there laughing to myself thinking these people don't understand they're chasing opportunity instead of chasing passion someone in obsession someone has already done that Groupon thing and sure you might be able to start a business like it but if you're on the me too bandwagon if you're constantly following on somebody else's coattails trying to look at what somebody else did and go hey they made a lot of money doing that I'm maybe I'll do that you're on the wrong track. You need to start with the thing that you are absolutely obsessed about. There will probably be a couple of things that you are absolutely obsessed and passionate about. And then you got to find one of those things that has an intersection with a human need out there in the marketplace that can make a true contribution to one of these emotional needs that I talked about in the last podcast. Validation, excitement, security, all right? Or transcendence. Um, those are the four basic needs. I talked about them in the last podcast. You got to find the intersection of your obsession in that one thing, and then you got to work on the strategy. If you haven't gotten that together, um, you need to get that together before you start branching off into other things. If you are thinking about getting into something else, ask yourself: Am I doing what I'm absolutely obsessed with, what I love right now? Um, if you are, stick with it. It'll eventually, you know. There's a saying that if you share a good idea long enough, it'll eventually fall on good ears, or ears that can understand it. Um, if there's people out there who genuinely need what you're doing, if there's an existing need and awareness of the need out in the marketplace, eventually you're going to find the right people. It may just take a while, but don't give up to the whole shiny object thing and try to branch off to things that you think are going to make you money but that you're not terribly excited about. So anyway, that's what I wanted to talk about because I'm starting to feel these little um, itches you know, to, to move out and to do other stuff. And I know that, you know, I basically just write those things down, I put them in a the drawer, and then I look at them a month later, and a lot of the time I'm like, yeah, it was a good idea, but not something I really want to do. Um, and, you know, eventually, um, well, that's all I've got to share right now. I don't want to go off in another rabbit hole. So, anyway, today is March 25th, 2019. My name is Seth Cherpak. This is my podcast, The Story of My Experiments with Hope. I'll put my goals and my progress below the video as usual. Thanks for tuning in, and you have a great week. Talk to you soon.